And it's very important to kind of be aware of what season we're at in our own spiritual life. Now, the season that I've been kind of going through in the last while is a season of understanding, coming to understand the mystery of the joy of the Lord. And, you know, I find myself um, confused a lot of the time over why I'm so happy. You know, I find myself laying in bed at night or driving to work in the morning or other times just asking myself, like, why am I so happy? You know, and, and, and kind of confuse this mysterious, mysterious joy. And uh, when, I, when I speak about this, I'm not suggesting that I'm happier than anyone else. But I do know that there's more joy in my life than there was before. You know, and it seems to be more and more joy. And um, again, it's, it's the whole measuring of joy is a mysterious thing. It's, it's, it's kind of like if a person is really, really poor and eventually they get enough money to buy a bicycle, they feel like a wealthy person. Other people might say, well, that's not wealthy. You just have a bicycle. Well, for the person who has a bicycle, he feels very wealthy, you know. And so it's the same thing uh, in my own life. Um, again, this joy hasn't always been a reality. If you've heard me share my story before, you know that at one time as a teenager, I was an atheist. And during that time, there was not much joy in my life. You know, but rather there was, there was emptiness. And so I guess I'm, I'm coming from, from extremes. Um, but again, I just find myself pondering this mystery of joy. And so I just want to share with you just, just some of the things that I've come to, to realize and understand. Some of the things that the Lord has been teaching me about the mystery of His joy. First of all, it's a biblical reality. You know, Scripture speaks a lot about the joy of the Lord. Scripture promises us joy. And not just any joy, as we heard in John 15, verse 11, the Lord Jesus says, I have told you this so that my, so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. And so again, the joy that we're promised in Scripture isn't just any joy, it's the joy of the Lord. Jesus says, my joy in you, and that this joy may be complete. So again, the joy of the Lord, it's a biblical promise. It's something that we should, we should expect. Secondly, this joy of the Lord is something, again, that's not meant to just stay stagnant or kind of come and go, but it's actually meant to increase. As we patiently persevere in the spiritual life, we should find that there is more and more and more joy in our lives. And we hear, we hear something uh, of this in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Paul speaking, all of us gazing with unveiled face on the glory of the Lord and being transformed in, into the same image from glory to glory as from the Lord who is the Spirit. This whole concept of the Lord taking us from glory to glory to glory. Again, when the Lord pours out His grace in His life, it never decreases. It always increases. Now, again, sometimes it kind of changes its direction. It's kind of like if you're a sailor, the wind of the Spirit's always blowing strong, but sometimes the wind changes directions. And if you miss it, you might think, oh, I lost my wind. You didn't lose your wind. You need to adjust your sails to a new season, a new wave of the Spirit in your life. And there's also, again, you've heard me speak about this before, Psalm 23, verse 5, the psalmist says, my cup overflows. Again, this is a biblical image of what the Lord wants to do in our life, the abundance of the Lord. In John chapter 3, verse 34, uh, the evangelist tells us, the Lord gives us His Spirit without measure. Or another translation, He doesn't ration His Spirit. And so these are just, these are just some of the scriptural um, you know, passages that we have that assure us that the joy of the Lord is something that we should expect. It comes with being with the Lord. 
It's, it's, it's some of the promises, one of the promises of Scripture, the joy of the Lord. So that's, that's the first thing. This is a biblical reality. The second thing I've come to, to understand and uh, appreciate more deeply is that prayer and the reading of Scripture causes the canyons of our lives to flood with this joy. You've probably heard that image before, the image of each one of us, we're kind of like a canyon, like a great big canyon, and the top of the canyon is kind of our surface feelings, you know, the sides of the canyon is more kind of our, our deeper satisfaction and contentment, but the, the bottom of the canyon, the depths of the canyon is the spirit. And if we're, if we're filled with the life of God, there's, there's water, there's living water, there's clean, pure water flowing in the depths of this canyon, giving life. But if we're spiritually dry, the canyon's dry. There's nothing there. And when the canyon of our lives is filled with this living water that Jesus promises us, there is joy. It's the source of joy. And again, I come to see, I've come to understand more and more that, that, that our prayer time, our daily prayer time is, is one of the key times where the Lord just wants to flood our canyon. He wants to flood our life with these living waters that give us this, this lasting joy, this, this, this deep joy. I was thinking about this, like, I like to start my day with prayer. I pray early in the morning, first thing in the morning, because that's what Scripture says to do. And Father Francis teaches us, he says, every one of us should pray every day at the same time in the same place. Did you know that? Same time, same place. Every day, same time, same place. We should all have that discipline as much as possible. Anyways, um, so I pray early in the morning, but some mornings, or most mornings as a matter of fact, after I do my prayer time, then I do scripture study and preaching preparation. And so sometimes I'll spend a few hours in the morning praying and then studying scripture and pondering scripture. And there's some mornings by the time I'm done all of this, like I feel inebriated, drunk in the spirit. Like I ask myself, like, am I safe to drive? You know? Like such is, is the, the joy. And, and again, it's mysterious. Like it's one of those times I'm asked, like, what is this? You know, like I've just spent hours praying and, and studying and preparing uh, God's Word, and there's this mysterious life, this joy. What is that, Lord? And again, I'm coming to understand more and more that, again, prayer, reading Scripture, it opens the floodgates of the Spirit in our life. It fills the canyon, and again, it remains with, it remains with us. Uh, the, the next thing that... Um, uh, is a factor in this whole joy thing, is what Peter Kreef, Peter Kreff calls the, co the constantly repeated experiment. The constant repeated experiment we all do over and over and over again. We always get the same results, but we do this experiment over and over again. We'll do it millions, maybe hundreds of million times in our whole life. And we are always going to get the same result, but we keep doing the experiment. The experiment goes like this. We have a situation. And we wonder, in this situation, what will make me happier, doing God's will or doing my own will? And we experiment, you know, and, and, and what we find is, if I do God's will, if I do God's will in a certain situation, which typically involves some kind of self-denial, some kind of sacrifice, involves courage. If I do God's will, it leaves me with, afterwards, with, with a kind of a joy, a contentment, a sense of, of, of freedom. Uh, I, feel, I feel like I'm a better person. But if we decide to wimp out, if we're not courageous, if we're cowardly, and we don't do God's will, but rather we do what is typically the easier, more selfish choice, it leaves us miserable and empty. And again, this little experiment happens over and over throughout our day. We have a situation, we think, gee, what should I do in this situation? What will make me feel, uh, experience more joy? Is it doing God's will or is it doing my selfish will? And again, when we learn that it's always, always, always 
worthwhile, beneficial to do God's will. That can be a big change in our life too. And again, this is, this is something I've tried to, and I continue, try is the operative word, to, to kind of live in my life. And again, it's a biblical principle. We, we hear about it in Matthew, the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39 says, whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, that mystery of, of denying ourselves, of sacrificing, of doing the courageous thing, doing God's will, a certain death to self always gives life and joy. But again, if we, if we do the opposite, um, it, it leaves us miserable and disappointed. The other, the other factor or reality the Lord's been showing me is, again, in terms of the joy, Lord, why? Why is there so much joy? Is um, respecting our humanity. One of the things we were taught as Companions of the Cross from day one when we joined the seminary, we were taught it from our founder. He insisted, guys, take care of yourselves. Exercise. Get proper sleep. Eat healthy. And when I started my formation, I had Father Francis in the house, and he was backing Father Bob up, especially with the healthy eating stuff, you know. And so from day one, we were, we were taught that, you know, respect your humanity. Look at Jesus. Jesus took times of rest. You know, Jesus took, got, went away to, to pray and so on and so forth. And so too, if you want to be a joyful instrument of the Lord, you need to look after yourself. You need to exercise regularly. Unless you have a job where you're, I don't know what, you know, delivering mail, walking, you know, tons of miles every day, well, then you don't need to go run on a treadmill every evening. That would be silly, you know. But you need to exercise. You need to eat healthy. We need to, we need to, to get proper, uh, proper rest. We need to have wholesome friendships. Did you know that? As human beings, we're emotional beings. We, we need good, wholesome friendships. And again, this is, this is something I've tried to incorporate into my life, and I know this, you know, like, it's a no-brainer. When I exercise, I feel much better. When I don't exercise, I feel sluggish and lethargic, and I'm not as joyful, I'm not as cheery. And I also notice this with people I live with, you know. When they're exercising and all that kind of stuff, they're a little more, you know, upbeat, and when they're not, they're, you know, kind of dragging themselves a bit, you know, and so... Um, so again, we need to res respect our humanity. And then finally, the whole call to virtue. You know, joy comes from being virtuous. Being virtuous and beatitude, they always go together. They're mutually in inclusive. And, and you've heard me speak about this before. You've heard my story. When I was first ordained, I was doing pretty good. You know, people like to hear what I had to say you know, new young priest. I got invited to speak at the youth conferences and all that. And on the outside, everyone thought that I was just flourishing. But on the inside, there was a lot of shame, a lot of frustration, um, a lot of confusion, because I was struggling with weaknesses that I thought would go away, that I'd been struggling with for years. And I thought, well, when I become a priest, obviously those things are going to go away. They didn't. And it was very frustrating. It was, it was a source of, of shame that I was still struggling with these weaknesses. And in the seminary, the, some of the priests, some of the young priests especially, were trying to teach us seminarians about growing in virtue, the classic wisdom in growing in virtue, but I didn't pay much attention to it. I thought, I have the Holy Spirit. I don't need anyone to teach me that kind of stuff, you know? Uh, but then I began to read early in my priesthood just... About, about growing in virtue, the need, the, 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 the universal call. Every one of us is called to grow in virtue, whether we like it or not. And I'll just summarize in one sentence what, how we grow in virtue. We grow in virtue by patiently and perseveringly allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us in making small, lasting changes in our life. That's one sentence. I wrote that myself, by the way. <laughs> Patiently and perseveringly allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us in making small, lasting changes in our life. 
And when I began to do that, when I began to work on one small thing, rather than trying to fix everything in my life right now, to just take one area of weakness in my life, what I did at the beginning, I'd take 40 days, I'd work it, I'd pray every day for the grace of the Holy Spirit. I'd ask the Lord, Lord, what, what do you want to change in my life? And as I began to do this, I began to change, little by little. At times, it was frustratingly slow, but I persevered because this was the wisdom. This is the wisdom of the ages. This is the wisdom of the church. And now, thanks be to God, the things I was struggling with, I don't struggle with those anymore. They're gone. I'm free, you know. And with that comes joy. There's joy in being free. And I haven't stopped that discipline. All of you who have treasure in heaven, I encourage everyone, every month, ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what one small change are you giving me the grace to make this month that will have the best positive impact in my life? I know a lot of us, we say, I ain't doing that, that's too slow one little change a month, come on, it'll take an eternity for me to improve. That's not true, because the Holy Spirit is amazingly efficient. The whole, every, every small step of the Holy Spirit, every small step the Holy Spirit asks us to take is really a huge step, a transforming step. So we need to have faith that if we ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what one small change are you giving me the grace to make this month that'll have the biggest impact in my life? Uh, that that change will be huge. And because I've been doing this for years, I mean, I've done all kinds of different things, you know, different months. You know, some, ha some has to do with, with my sleeping patterns, my eating patterns, prayer, relationships with people, all kinds of things. Last month, sometimes I do funny things, and I, I pray about it. I honestly believe that it's the Lord who, who, who kind of gives me these inspirations. Last month, when I was praying, what came to mind is there was one thing that I've been putting off for over a year, or maybe a year, that I, was, that I just haven't been doing, and that's fix my trailer. I own a motorcycle, a little dirt bike, I pull it on a little trailer, but my trailer was falling apart, which is kind of dangerous, you know, going down the 45 with a trailer that's falling apart. But it was one of those things, oh, I'll get around to it, you know, what's a couple loose screws, what's a couple missing bolts, you know? And then finally I said, you know what, I've been putting this off too long, I'm gonna fix it. This month is gonna be the month, it's the one thing I'm gonna do before there's an accident. So I fixed it, I fixed it as a matter of fact in the first couple days of the month. And then I said, well, Lord, I, I'm done. So the Lord said, okay, well, why don't you fix, my, you know, I have one of those GPS units. I bought it like two or three years ago. Sometimes I'm driving, it's all mixed up because there's new roads, you know. And I paid extra money to have free updates. I'm just too lazy to figure out how to update it. So I said, okay, I'm gonna update my GPS. So I updated my GPS. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do now? My blinker wasn't working on my car. You know, and do you ever try changing those light bulbs? Sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it's the biggest pain, you know, is it, I fixed my blinker. Then, my car, this is embarrassing to me, because my car was a mess. Like, I like to surf, and my surfboard sometimes is full of sand. I put it in the car, and there's just sand all over my car. And it's one of those things, well, I'll get around to vacuum it. I vacuumed, I cleaned my car. Then I said, Lord, what do I do now? I have one suit. A black suit. Sometimes when I go to social functions, you know, I get a little bit of, you know, wine or food on it. And because it's black, it doesn't really show dirt, but it's one of those things I, I need to bring it to the dry cleaner. It's one of those things, well, I'll get around to it. I brought my suit to the dry cleaner. It's clean now. And then finally, <laughs> finally, yes, thank you, thank you. Isn't that wonderful? And then finally, in the last couple of days, just before the end of the month, there was a bolt on my motocross bike that was missing. So one of the wire guides was, and it was one of those little fiddly things. Ah, it's not a big deal. I fixed it. And it feels great. Again, the joy of the Lord, there's something about letting the Lord guide us, give us the grace to make changes in our life. And that's, that's, not, a, that's not what I typically do. This month, the Lord gave me something very interesting. It's kind of personal, but I'm very excited about it. A small change that I really think will make a big difference in my life and in my ministry. Do that, brothers and sisters. Make one small change every, every month, but ask the Lord what that change is. So again, the Lord, He calls us to joy. He promises us joy. He wants us to have His joy. He wants us to find joy through prayer and Scripture, supernatural, life-giving water that fills our canyon. He wants us to be people who are willing to sacrifice 
to do God's will, to deny ourselves and to find life through that. He wants us to respect our humanity. Again, eating healthy, exercising, getting proper sleep, having good, healthy, wholesome relationships, other things like that. We need to do those things. And then finally, the Lord wants us to grow in virtue. Growing in virtue is a universal call. We're all called to it. And so let's allow the Lord to give us this gift. Joy is ultimately a gift. Even if you do all these things I mentioned, it's ultimately a gift from God. So let's pray for that gift. Let's pray for it. Let's receive it so that we may have the Lord's joy and our joy may be complete.